the great honor of having Dr. Clemens here to present today. As many of you know, he's on faculty at MD Anderson Cancer Center at the University of Texas in Houston. He completed plastic surgery training at Georgetown, went on to do research training programs at the NIH and Harvard Children's Hospital, and, on to, and went on to, uh, <coughs> to go on further training in microvascular surgery at MD Anderson. He currently leads a multidisciplinary research team and tissue repository focused on the study of breast implant-associated anaplastic large cell lymphoma and currently serves an, as an ASPS liaison to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and chairs a subcommittee for ASPS overseeing national research and education efforts for uh, breast implant-associated ALCL. We're really honored to have Dr. Clemens, who's really, honestly, probably one of the world experts on this topic. We have put together uh, a collection of ALCL-specific articles uh, that uh, you can access for free on prsjournal.com. But please uh, uh, st uh, stay till the end through the lectures for what we hope will be a robust uh, Q&A, very interesting discussion. Also, if having Dr. Clements wasn't uh, enough of a treat, uh, PRS and PRS Global Open will be raffling a uh, Amazon Echo after the, uh, after the event. So, Stay here, there's Kristen and the PRS team which will come by and give you the raffling tickets. And just as an FYI, uh, we'll be recording the lecture and uh, the Q&A to post it on PRS Journal website and um, uh, these various social media channels. If you do not wish to be part of it, you can still ask questions, just, let, just find one of us uh, at the end uh, so that we can, uh, um, we can arrange so that you do not appear. And now it's my great honor to present uh, Dr. Mark Clemens. Thank you again once uh, for being here. It's a true honor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I want to thank uh, PRS uh, for the invitation uh, to be able to share some of our research, as well as give a unique perspective on this. They asked me to take some PRS articles. We're going to take five and really show how the current state of understanding of this disease as seen through the lens of those five articles. So again, I appreciate your interest in this. I'd like it to be informal. We're gonna have a very long Q&A session afterwards and I want you to feel comfortable asking any questions that you may have. If you're only here for the Amazon Echo, that's fine too. And we'll be doing that at the end. So thank you. I'm gonna be talking about what you need to know about an emerging malignancy, breast implant associated ALCL. I don't have any financial disclosures. I used to work as a consultant with Allergan back in 2015. I ended that basically when I started really doing this research a lot. I do chair the ALCL uh, committee uh, for the American Society of Plastic Surgeons. I do act as a liaison to the FDA and I am a co-author for Lymphoma Guidelines for the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. Five articles that we're going to be highlighting today are up on the screen, very tiny. Uh, first, we're gonna be talking about US epidemiology of breast implant ALCL, and I'll be giving you an update on that. This article is about a year and a half old, and I'll be telling you the newest numbers. We're gonna look at global adverse event reports, that article, and giving you an update as of today. Uh, the uh, Milan Breast Aesthetic Breast Meeting Consensus Conference report that came out last year. Our review CME article, which came out in April on how to diagnose and treat breast implant ALCL. And then we'll talk a little bit about pathogenesis, an article that we did with uh, Macquarie University in bacteria and in breast implant ALCL. I want to start with an overall background, which is how to achieve reliable diagnosis and management. This was a CME article that we released in April, and the idea was to demystify this disease, to reliably, in an evidence-based approach, how are we going to treat this? And this treatment is actually by the National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines. That is what's recognized by the FDA, that's what's recognized by oncology organizations as a reliable method of treatment of this disease. And under that, surgical resection is absolutely essential and is curative in the vast majority of patients. Now let's break that down into diagnosis, 
and treatment. So diagnosis has three main components. CD30 immunohistochemistry, cytology with large anaplastic cells, as you can see, and then flow cytometry. All three need to be present for the diagnosis of this disease. Any one of them by itself, maybe that's inflammation. Maybe that's a different disease. But all together, that's how we define this. I want to point out this other review that was just published in Modern Pathology Nature. That's one of the very top, that's one of the top three pathology uh, uh, journals worldwide. It's actually a subset of Nature. And we just published this review so that if you have a questionable patient and you want to send it to your pathologist, you don't have to necessarily give them a PRS review. You can give them a pathology review in their journal to speak their language to help them achieve diagnosis. We did the same thing with surgical management in the surgical oncology literature. So I published this in the Journal of Clinical Oncology where we demonstrated that surgical management and surgical management alone was highly curative, 4% recurrence rates up to five years out. And we achieved statistical significance in both overall survival as well as event-free survival. The disappointing thing was what we found um, how many different ways these patients are treated. Notice 60% getting chemotherapy, 45% getting radiation therapy, 7% getting stem cell transplant. We consider that over-treatment in the vast majority of patients. And then the last component is total capsulectomy. We really have started using the term N-block resection because it's more than you're used to doing with a capsulectomy. This isn't like a capsulectomy for capsular contracture where you may leave the posterior wall intact. It's incredibly important to treat that this is a cancer. The capsule is the disease, and it must be completely resected. Notice in this video, as I'm resecting the posterior wall, something that we'd frequently leave in capsular contracture, and in that yellow circle is a mass growing on the capsule. If I didn't appreciate that ahead of time, if I didn't cut it completely out, that is going to be a source of recurrence in the future. And all of these uh, main techniques are delineated in that CME article. I also want to highlight the importance of NCCN guidelines. I won't go into them in detail, but this is the evidence-based approach that we recognize is the best way to treat this disease. And I'm very pleased to say that this is going to be updated in January 2019, and we're going to have further messaging on that when that comes out. But this is the recognized way that we treat it. Let's move on to U.S. epidemiology. We did this manuscript about 18 months ago with one of my fellows, uh, and we reviewed 100 U.S. pathologically confirmed cases, and we came up with a lifetime risk in the U.S. of 1 in 30,000 women with a textured implant. That was much higher than previously thought. For instance, that's 67 times higher than the general population. And that 1 in 30,000, when people were previously saying 1 in 500,000, 1 in a million, 1 in 4 million, this really brought it home and gave us a better understanding of what that risk is. However, that was 18 months ago. So this is a global reporting as we recognize. That was a Today, we recognize 239 cases in the United States, coming out to a rate of 1 in 12,000 for the U.S., Netherlands coming in at 1 in 6,900. Both of those numbers are for all textured implants. Australia breaks it down by manufacturer. Australia coming in with Biocell, 1 in 3,300, Celamed polyurethane, 1 in 2,800, Mentor Siltex, 1 in 86,000. And I'm frequently asked, why don't your numbers line up with Australia? Well, it's important to understand these numbers. My number is an average of the manufacturers in the U.S. We're not breaking it down. If you take a 50% market that's split 50-50, 1 in 12,000 starts to line up with some of the other countries that are reporting. So we're not as far off as you would Moving on. Where does the world stand? So as part of ASPS, we formed a global network 
around the world of 30 countries where we asked individual representatives in those countries to say how many cases were happening in that country that were confirmed, there's no duplicates, we're absolutely certain. If you've got a questionable case, we don't count it. These are ones that we have to be absolutely certain. And to date, there's 602 pathological confirmed cases worldwide with 16 deaths. And you can actually see how they break down in countries around the world. We're indebted to the local uh, resources that made this possible. If we use this number, 602 worldwide, 239 to the profile registry, we see about a 44% jump in the number of known cases over the past 12 months and a 45% jump in the number of U.S. cases. In death, we're finally getting a better handle on this because frequently they're not reported. So we've actually caught up with about 77% jump in the number of deaths just in the past 12 months. Again, does this mean that everything's happening in the last few months? No, we're finding cases from a decade ago or two decades ago. It's spread out over the last two decades. Then I'm gonna add on pathogenesis. So this was a manuscript in a collaboration that we did at MD Anderson with McCourney University. And the idea was that a gram-negative bacteria could be leading to breast implant ALCL. Now I wanna point out some of the evolution that we've seen with this um, theory. For instance, in 2016, in PRS, we came up, uh, the idea was presented of Raustonia Piketty being a driver for it. That was updated in PRS in 2017 that it wasn't necessarily always Piketty, it could be a subspecies of Raustonia, any type of Raustonia. And then we see in 2018 this updated where it might not be specifically Raustonia, it could be any gram-negative bacteria. So it's the lipopolysaccharide of a bacteria stimulating lymphocytes, possibly becoming a uh, lymphoma. So where does this mean? Well, we know that textured implants do have higher infection rates. This was a manuscript I did with John Kim where he showed a three times higher infection rate with textured over smooth in a prospective series. This is the MROC data. Based on what we know about textured implants, some authors propose the idea, based on their own practice, that they didn't have any ALCL. And so they hypothesized that maybe it was just technique uh, that was preventing them from having ALCL. So we actually, we actually uh, I think it's, so we actually looked at intraoperative technique in ALCL patients, and what we found was is that there was no overriding technique that was present in those patients. For instance, some had betadine, some had sterile technique used, uh, some had chlorhexidine. Out of these 24 patients, all of them had some type of anti-infective strategy and yet still developed ALCL. So while we do know that implants have higher bacteria, we don't know how to affect that reliably or change a patient's risk based on that. This is one of the last articles that we uh, published in PRS where he talked about including it as part of your informed consent. And it's very important that you actually let patients know that this can occur and just to warn them of what the signs are. We just did a study where we canvassed over 800 ASPS membership to see if they included it as part of their informed and approximately 60% of U.S. physicians out of those 800 did include it as part of informed consent, but one-third still do not. When asked why, they said that the risk was too low and that it was still questionable whether this disease exists. This was a manuscript that just came out in the past year, and this was a consensus report from the Milan Aesthetic Breast Meeting, and it really encapsulated what we know about this disease. Some main points is that one, it's an uncommon neoplasm. Two, is that it is an anaplastic lymphoma. Three, its progression is very similar to a solid tumor. It usually acts regionally, locally. Late seroma is not necessarily a direct precursor of the disease. So you can have a benign late seroma that is not ALCL. 
but all late seromas should be tested for ALCL. What proportion of delayed seromas are ALCL? One in 10, based on two prospective series. All late seromas should be tested for cytology, flow cytometry, as well as CD30, and that breast implant patients should be thoroughly informed of this when considering a procedure. Now, I think it's important. I've highlighted manuscripts that were in PRS, but we've really tried to push forward multidisciplinary messaging. We've published all of these manuscripts in multidisciplinary uh, uh, journal so that you can give a pathology paper to a pathologist, an oncology paper in blood to an oncologist, a surgical oncology manuscript to a surgical oncologist, so that you can speak their language with literature in their field. Now, I want to end on where is the profile registry right now? Well, coming up in uh, the spring of next year, PRS is going to have a supplement highlighting eight articles that represent where we stand, our best understanding of ALCL. I was invited by Dr. Rorick to be the editor, uh, guest editor of this supplement uh, with Dr. Anand Diva. I'm very excited. I've read these articles about what's coming, and it's going to really advance our understanding of this disease. As a glimpse into what's coming, I want to show you what we've seen with the profile registry. And this is an article that is in that supplement. 239 cases reported in the United States, of which we had detailed information on 98 cases. And a number of firsts are reported here for the very first time. One of them is the very first African-American case. One of them is the very first tissue expander case, textured tissue expander, smooth implant, and then develop the disease. One is the very first uh, incidental finding where a patient developed breast cancer, then got a mastectomy, had breast implants, and incidentally found ALCL, so two separate primaries. We also report two bilateral cases. So this is going to be a very powerful paper when it comes out. The lead author is going to be Dr. Colleen McCarthy, who is a principal investigator for Profile. So I want to end there. In conclusion, ALCL is a lymphoma based on all the World Health Organization, all government authorities, everybody that's ever recognized this. NCC and guidelines are the standard of care for the diagnosis and treatment of this disease. Disease awareness is critically important, as is appropriate testing and reporting. If we don't get these cases, we can't track them, we don't know what works, and we're not going to learn more about it. So please include it as part of your uh, breast implant informed consent. And I'm going to leave it there so that we can have an open discussion about these manuscripts or anything else that you've heard about other things that we've published. And I appreciate your interest. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Clemens. Uh, that was truly interesting and insightful talk. And I'm sure that it will spark a great deal of discussion. Uh, as a reminder to our audience, uh, you can read for free ALCL studies uh, on prsjournal.com and make sure to get the raffle tickets that hopefully have gone by or, or Donnell is going to push them through again. And uh, with that, we will open the floor for questions uh, to Dr. Clemens. And we have a first one here. Thank you very much. That was a great presentation. Um, if you had a sister or mother or your wife even had one of these implants, would you recommend that they have them taken out? Uh, I would not. Um, nobody's recommending prophylactic explantation. So you can imagine you have this very uncommon rare risk to put a patient through a surgery with all the inherent risks of that um, to infinitesimally affect a risk of this is not worth it. So nobody, not the FDA, not any society, is recommending a prophylactic explantation. And that's critically important. We don't want patients to necessarily get a surgery that is not indicated. Thank you. Hello, it's Dr. Keramidas from Greece. Thank you very much for your presentation and thank you very much for all your job you do for us. Uh, it's a medical legal thing. Let's say a patient 10 years down the line her husband ACLC, and you go to the court. So who is uh, supporting you? 
because the lawyer will say, okay, Dr. Keramidas, you knew one in 3,000, 30,000, one in a million, maybe you can create, you can create cancer with this uh, surgery. So who will support me? Who I need to call to support that I did the right thing? Uh, so my mentor at uh, Georgetown was uh, Scott Spear. And he actually, one of his teachings that he would tell us as a resident was that people don't necessarily judge you for your complication, but they judge you for how you manage your complication. I think that if we are upfront with patients, we let them know that this is a possibility. The risk is in the package insert. It has been since 2012. The risk is listed in uh, example consent forms from ASPS. Um, all we can do is let a patient know what it is, and then if they present with that symptom, we test appropriately and we manage it appropriately. In that situation, whatever happens is very defensible. Uh, we have seen a number of uh, uh, lawsuits raised in the past year, none directed to physicians, but three directed to manufacturers, two to Allergan, one to Mentor. And they've specifically been addressed at uh, failure to warn. However, you could make the argument it's been in the package insert uh, since the FDA safety communication in 2011. So if the warning is there, uh, that's usually the tack that most lawyers would take. Um, so we, we are trying to make sure that physicians are approaching this responsible and that they are protected to the best of their ability. But... Um, so long as you're open and upfront with a complication and then manage it appropriately, I think that that's the best you can do for a patient. Thank you very much. And do you think we need to use soft implants now and forget about texture? Yeah, so you're asking an American. Yes. Uh, so in the United States, we have an 87% smooth implant market. What do I use? I use all smooth implants, but I like a smooth implant. I think you might get a different answer if you were in Greece or I in know. Europe or South America or Australia, where the predominantly used textured implant. And I think it's going to be more of a difficult question for them. I tell people the FDA assures that all breast implants, textured and smooth, are safe and efficacious. They do what they're intended to do. So you can use any implant that you want, and I'm not going to say that they should be banned. But I think that you should evaluate this risk and any risk that you have with any implant. Thank you very much. That was a great presentation, thank you. Uh, you mentioned that um, it's very important to warn patients who are new coming into your office about the risks. Uh, can you comment on previous patients who you hadn't had that conversation with initially and how to manage reaching out or not reaching out to those patients to inform them retrospectively? Th that's a really great question. I don't know if everybody heard that, but it's about the retroactive alerting of patients that have received a breast implant. This is more controversial. My recommendation is to make reasonable efforts uh, to let a, patient, a previous patient know. What does that mean in my own practice is that if I have a follow-up from years prior and they happen to have a textured implant, I may let them know about this risk or that uh, it's been brought to our attention by the uh, FDA. But there's some institutions that take that a step further. For instance, Penn State has actually advocated retroactively alerting all their patients. That manuscript, I believe, is going to be either, I want to say October or November PRS, uh, from Dr. Uh, John Patochny. And what they did was they alerted 1,400 previous patients, and then they recorded what happened when they did. And there was a very sizable response, a lot of phone calls coming in, a lot of nervous patients. But that only lasted for about 72 hours. And they answered questions. And then they saw an uptick. About 5% of the patients actually asked to have a follow-up, to come back into the office to talk about it. And then out of those 1,400 patients, and I don't want to get this completely wrong, but it came out to about six patients that asked for a prophylactic explantation. Again, we don't advocate that, but that was the result of retroactively alerting patients. Now, that was them. But now we're starting to see some other institutions do it. So Memorial Sloan Kettering as of three months ago, retroactively alerted all of their breast implant patients with a letter. No society is necessarily recommending this, 
but the American Society of Plastic Surgeons, we have an example letter on our website that you can download as an example of how you might have that conversation and a letter that you may send to your patients. So we're not making the recommendation, but as we see more institutions tackling this question, we want to give you the resources to be able to make up your mind for yourself. I'll, uh, I'll ask one more question. So many of us uh, residents are going to go into practice, um, and you have mentioned the ASPS consent form. Perhaps uh, many of us are not familiar with that, but what kind of conversation would you have with your uh, new patients that either want to undergo breast augmentation or uh, breast implant-based uh, breast reconstruction? Right. So uh, we wrote the manuscript on a breast implant informed consent should include the risk of ALCL. The entire idea of informed consent, there's a real philosophy behind it. I don't want to be prescriptive about the conversation that you're going to have in your cons consult room. It's a very personal discussion, and it changes between every single patient, and it's up to you to express risk, both common and rare but serious. What is important is to give them some kind of literature, something to read. Um, that Studies have shown that in part of the informed consent process, that engenders better retention of the risks that you're saying. If you were to test them after they walked out of your office, they've forgotten 90% of what you said. But if you give them a piece of paper, a pamphlet, something that says what it is, then they're able to read it, digest it in their own time. So the uh, informed consent from ASPS, it's 14 pages long for just a breast implant. Your package insert that you have in the breast implant uh, box is over 100 pages. I don't intend you to say every single word in there, but actually, if you take Allergan or Mentor, they actually say in that package insert, they suggest you give the patient that package insert, let them read it themselves, and, and then get back to you with any questions. Or give them a copy of the ASPS informed consent let them read through it themselves, and then get back to you. Um, have a discussion, but be reasonable. Don't harp on this. It's super rare. But, but be reasonable and give them realistic expectation of what a breast implant is. Hi. Um, could you comment at all on the genetic piece of this? It, because, you know, with this, I see a tsunami coming with the prepectoral, you know, shaped implant that's kind of being pushed as sort of the, the way to go in the future. And this sort of piece of everyone getting a textured 410. Um, I know there's some genetic jack stat issues. Do you see genetic testing maybe for patients who might be bad candidates for implants? So that, that would be fantastic. The idea is uh, we are seeing genetic drivers for this disease. When we've tested cases, we see that they have specific driver mutations that are also present in systemic ALCL. So that means if they've got a genetic mutation that's a germline, they're born with it, you could test for it and you could tell who is uh, potentially at risk. Ideally creating a BRCA-like test for ALCL. We're not there yet. We're trying to find it. We've recognized these uh, genes and now we've got to do a step further. What proportion of patients have that? We need to get away from just single digit uh, testing, you know, maybe four or five cases, and we need 50 cases to definitively say, what is the rate of these mutations in these patients? And then we have to say, what's the rate in the general population? Because if we have something that's highly predictive, but 90% of patients have it, then it's not helpful when we're testing our patients. So we're probably a few years away, but I think that one day we will have a, uh, a test to be able to say who does well, and maybe who should get a smooth implant. I have one more question. I had a patient recently who had positive CD30 cells, but it was not, all the other criteria were not met. Um, reconstructive patient, what would be your recommendation for treatment go, cause going forward with that? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, patient uh, pathology report comes back with two CD30 positive normal looking cells. I get on nearly a weekly basis, somebody writing me saying, my patient has two cells of lymphoma. What do I do? That, that's not lymphoma. In fact, 1% to 5% of your circulating lymphocytes express CD30. It is a normal marker. 
but it is also 100% of these cells. So we call it a diagnostic test. It's part of the diagnosis, but it is not a pathognomonic test in and of itself, the diagnosis. It requires a clonal expansion on flow cytometry. It requires abnormal large anaplastic cells on cytology. All of those components you need together. So if you see a, a few CD30 positive cells, you probably have a high state. In fact, there's some diseases that have extremely high levels of CD30. Mononucleosis for about two weeks will give 95% of your circulating lymphocytes express CD30, but then it goes away. So again, it's a marker, but it's not pathognomonic. I have a, que I have a question. Uh, Hello. Thank you so much for your talk. It was uh, really excellent. And we, again, are so fortunate to have you here being really the world expert of this disease. You mentioned here in the United States, we don't use textured implants as often as other places in the world. What is the trend with the use of textured implants here in the United States as well as elsewhere? And where do you see textured implants? What role are they going to be playing in the future? And, or do you see them slowly will making phasing out of the market? Uh, so that Hello? Hello? Um, so that's tough. That requires a crystal ball. Requires a crystal ball to, uh, Hello? <laughs> Requires a crystal ball to say what's the, what's the future. Um, when we actually look at NISQIP data, and this is a study out of uh, um, uh, Michigan uh, that's coming out in PRS. It's been accepted, and it's coming out in the next few months. They looked at NISQIP data, trying to look at trends in textured uh, implant use, and if it's changed over the last uh, five to seven years. And then the answer was actually no, uh, that it was not noticing a decrease, that it had been pretty much stagnant. So we see uh, textured implants come on the US market in 2012. Then it hits about 13% of market share. And then it bounces around between 10 and 13% over the last uh, five to seven years. And it's actually not plummeting. It's not going down. It's just not going up. There is a core number of uh, physicians that like the devices, uh, feel that it does have a benefit over a, a round implant. And I don't know how that's going to change in the future. Um, or if that'll stay constant or what will happen to it. I have seen uh, manufacturers that will experiment with different types of texturing. So the idea of maybe we have this texturing, but we also want to develop another one just in case you want to try it, um, as well as experimenting with more types of smooth. So smooth tissue expanders coming on the market about a year ago, um, already taking about a quarter of the tissue expander market just in the last 12 months. Um, this is really a question of, it's rapidly evolving, and I, and I don't know exactly how it's going to change. Um, great talk. So you've had a patient who you've diagnosed with ALCL. At what point do you refer them to a surgical oncologist, if ever, or do you think it's the plastic surgeon's job to manage them throughout their treatment and recurrence monitoring? Yeah, so that's a really good question, too. Who should be actually doing this surgery treatment? The answer should be who feels most comfortable. So. If you have a uh, cosmetic plastic surgeon that doesn't do tumor ablation, isn't used to doing uh, lymph node dissections, they may not feel comfortable with doing this end block resection. Again, more complicated than just a, a total capsulectomy. However, if they do feel comfortable, they've done uh, sentinel, it's not a sentinel lymph node, but if there is an involved lymph node, you should do an excisional biopsy. Um, they should feel comfortable excising a mass and making sure that you got margins around it. Uh, they should feel comfortable with just oncologic technique. If they do feel comfortable, then they can do that. Um, our recommendation is to consider a surgical oncologist. Probably more important than that, though, is the lymphoma oncologist. That needs to happen immediately upon diagnosis, not after you've taken them to the operating room, not six months later, hope that they follow up with them, you need them on your team. This is a multidisciplinary team that's going to be used to treat them, and you need to have communication back and forth because they may, that oncologist may think that this is systemic ALCL, and they're going to start treating with radiation therapy and stem cell transplant. You need to make sure that you are on the same page with them. You also need to get appropriate staging. 
I see so many plastic surgeons get the diagnosis, and they immediately want to rip that implant out and get them on the OR schedule. You need to do a proper oncologic workup with a PET CT scan to determine extent of disease, if there's any associated mass, is there lymph node metastasis, so that you go into surgery with an appropriate road map. So that's kind of my sequence of events that comes up. Hi, Terry, by the way. Congratulations on uh, being uh, the uh, patient of courage. We, we really expect, uh, respect your uh, you role very, with that. Thank you very much. I appreciate you mentioning that. So I have a question. I'm a patient. I have been given all of my options for breast reconstruction. I am absolutely concerned or absolutely positive that I don't want to have autologous tissue. I want to have implants. But yikes, I'm starting to read the data and I'm starting to hear about BIA ALCL. What are the three most important questions that I should ask my plastic surgeon going into my consult to ease my mind? Because you guys stated last year, I saw Dr. McCurry last night, I said one of the most important things you said is we have to control the message. So help me control the message for the patients. Yeah, so um, I know that you've been uh, closely involved with this idea of shared decision making with patients. And I'm very much for educating patients because it truly empowers patients when they have this education. We have to respect a patient's ability to take in this difficult, complex information and make a decision for themselves. With our help, we have all the information, but we have to express that and we have to get away from almost a paternalistic approach of making the decisions for them. So the three things that I would ask is when you're going to consider a procedure is, number one, what possibly could go wrong? I need to know the risk. What, what are the risks that I'm entailing? And give me some kind of reference about what those risks are, um, how common, how rare, okay. so that I can internalize that information. Number two, if there's something that I'm really worried about, like if it's on the tip of your tongue, I just saw a front page in the New York Times, ALCL. That's the one that's in my mind that I want to really worry about. I know it's rare. I'm still going to get the implants. But what's my number two question? What's the symptom? Okay. Because how can I see it? If, if I'm aware and I'm looking for it, then I know if it occurs, I'm going to get it appropriate, appropriately treated in a timely fashion. So it's the symptom. How do I look for it? That's in a large effusion. Your breast doubling to tripling in size. Number three, what should I do about it? That come back and see your physician. Those three things, awareness, symptomatology, and what to do about it, action, come back and see your physician. That means no matter, even if this happens, I'm going to be safely treated. Okay. I'm going to be safe in, in, the, in the end. Thank you for that answer. That's a good circular closure to the question I asked. So thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks again, Dr. Clements. Thank you.